Hello and welcome to my Critical Meshikayot series. Uh, this will be a series of videos where I take a very critical look at things pertaining to Meshikayot. My name is Ruben Ariano, also known as Tlacatecat. Uh, this is lecture one and this is uh, the pilot for this series. In this pilot, we are going to be discussing uh, a very influential book in Mexicayot by Dr. Ignacio Romero Vargas Iturbide. The name of the book is Los Gobiernos Socialistas de Anahuac. Uh, and this edition in particular was published in 1988. I'm not exactly sure, uh, but I think that this is a later edition. I think there was one before this one that was published. Uh, and the pages that we're going to be looking at are pages 19 through 22. Essentially, this is chapter 2. Uh, most of the chapters in this book are very short. They range between 3 pages to 5 pages uh, and so on. So uh, we're going to be looking at the one that discusses Organización Política Anahuac. And I believe that is the title of the chapter itself. Now. Romero Vargas Iturbide, in this particular chapter of his book, discusses the overall class structure of Anahuaca society, which he describes as a culture of collectivist effort and service. He then posits five fundamental characteristics of Anahuaca institutions. So before I go down the list, um, I should also mention, for those of you that are unfamiliar with some of these ideas, um, there has been uh, for a long time within Mexica circles, Calpulis, etc., uh, this notion that you know, our ancestors um, were part of a uh, confederacy of sorts, that that idea of empire uh, is a Western sort of imposed philosophical, um, governmental, organizational structure, and that, you know, our ancestors didn't really, you know, try to subjugate other people um, because they were mean or because they were greedy and they wanted their resources, but rather because um, they were just expanding their, their, um, extending their confederacy, bringing more peoples into the fore and, and exposing them to different ways of, uh, of living that were based on a more collectivist society, which is in Nahuatl, the, the language of the Mexica, or as most of you might know them as the Aztecs, right? Uh, the Tequillot, okay? Tequillot is basically collective labor, and that's where uh, su uh, supposedly, our ancestors would um, work in, in unison with people within their society, uh, and, and the idea was to work in service of the society for the greater good, and not necessarily for personal gain. Although you do have instances of people that um, were better off than others. For example, the Pochteca. The Pochteca would have been the merchants, uh, especially those that would travel abroad to different parts of uh, Anahuac or even beyond what we would call Mesoamerica and perhaps even you know into the greater Southwest. Uh, there's evidence of Pochteca making it all the way into uh, what is now New Mexico and, and you know, exchanging goods and services with uh, the Pueblo peoples uh, or their ancestors. Um, and also venturing into uh, a lot of uh, what is now uh, southern Mexico into Guatemala and all the way down into Nicaragua, you know, um, exchanging goods and services with the Maya peoples, etc., uh, etc. Et right, so you do have instances of some sort of capitalistic um, venture that's taking place, but presumably these ventures are for the greater good of the society as well, because most of these capitalistic endeavors are for the profit of uh, the people who are in the leadership roles of the Federation and somehow uh, through their um, 
yeah, goodwill, uh, these things sort of trickle down, right? Some of you might understand what I'm saying if you have studied American history, especially from the 80s, the Reagan era, or government and, and the economics, all these things tied together, and you might understand what trickle-down economics means. It also went by the name of voodoo economics, this idea that the, that if you cut taxes on the rich, if you allow them to prosper, that somehow out of their goodwill, these uh, oligarchs and these corporate giants will um, allow uh, their wealth to trickle down to the masses, right? And so I don't want to get into that right now, but that's kind of like the idea that a lot of Mexica sort of have of our ancestors, you know, this idea that, that they were very beneficent and that everything was done for the greater good of the society as a whole, which, I mean, there is something to be said about, uh, about that, but at the same time, these people were also human beings, and so we can't uh, completely rule out the fact that um, there was cases of people potentially doing it for personal gain. Okay, so we have both of these things happening in conjunction. Uh, but according to Romero Vargas y Turbide, you know the way that the 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 organization, the institutional organization of these these um, political entities was uh, made up was through these five fundamental characteristics. And so number one, which would be the tequillot, which we kind of briefly just discussed. And then number two, we have agriculture, the idea that the food that is being grown, the, the corn, beans and squash, tomatoes, chilies, and, you know, aguacates, we go down the list of the many different types of foodstuffs that our ancestors uh, contributed to to the world at large. And apparently this was also done for the greater good of the society. Uh, and then the way that he explains this is that things were distributed uh, according to the needs of the people and the needs of uh, the, that specific uh, entity, that specific, whether ethnic or whether political, uh, and that these uh, the, the the collective labor and the agriculture was done uh, through this this collectivist mindset of also distribution, right? The same thing with manufacturing. Manufacturing was done for the greater good of the collective political entity at large. And what is that political entity? Well, at the end, he tells you, uh, number five is in Spanish, he calls it el, uh, Estado Federal, which if you know anything about how these things are translated from Spanish into English in, in English, uh, in, in our uh, conception of it here in the United States, at least, it would be more of a confederacy and not a federal system. The federal system is what we have, uh, where you have um, states that are independent, but they uh, pretty much answer to the federal government in Washington, D.C. In a confederacy, at least in the true confederacy, not like in the Civil War confederacy, that was also kind of a federalist system of sorts. But in a true um, simple confederacy, and simple, I don't mean like it, it was it was easy, but simple means that it wasn't structured in, in a very in complicated way. Uh, in a true confederacy, simple conf confederacy, you have independent communities, independent city-states, and uh, perhaps even as uh, large as nation-states that uh, are bound together by a common destiny, a common goal. And so that's what he's he's trying to lay this out as early as chapter two. He's already laying this out. And the remainder of the book is... Is his way of explaining how this thing played out uh, politically at the local level and at the macro level. And so just to show you, this is a screen grab of the book, um, at least the, the, the pages in, in reference and that we're going to be looking at here shortly. And um, you go from page 20, 21, 22, and then chapter three begins in page 23. And so um, 
it might be a little bit difficult to read uh, as you are watching this video so we'll just go ahead and skip over to the next slide where I basically uh, transcribe this but in list form for the benefit of this discussion okay so this is essentially I've synthesized what he says in, in, in those paragraphs that were which is actually one paragraph that bleeds over from one page to the next but in that one paragraph that where he talks about the the six major political uh, organizations that he has come up with somehow and we'll get into what I mean by that here in a minute so the first one is as most of you probably understand is El Calpulli Rural and El Calpulli Rural as it states here in Spanish was Autonomo y Disperso okay and I'm going to go over this in English so don't worry for those of you that don't read or speak Spanish El segundo was El Calpulli Urbano Autonomo y Concentrado a Manera de Barrio El tercero la región o Ikniutli de Calpultin, hermandad, fraternidad, grupo de amistad, de caseríos, entidad regional autónoma, llamado Tlatocayot, gobierno. El cuarto, los territorios o señoríos del Estado, autónomos, pero la autoridad dependía del Estado llamados Tecuyot, señorío. El quinto, el estado independiente llamado Wei Tlatocayot, gran gobierno. El sexto, la federación de estados llamada Tlatlacay Nuyot, hermandad o amistad de gobernantes o Tecpilot, conjunto de principales o palaciegos. So here's the English translation to this. So you have territorial organizations, the first one being the rural Calpuli, autonomous and dispersed, meaning sort of uh, what today we would call a small town. Uh, you know, I'm going to try to equate these things into uh, entities that we recognize today in our mo in our modern conception of political governments at least the way that it is here in the United States um, number two you had the urban Calpulli autonomous and concentrated like a neighborhood so this is a little tricky because the, the urban Calpulli could be as it was in places like the Mexico Tenochtitlan uh, a neighborhood right so depending on what kind of city you live in you might have you know different neighborhoods that comprise one entire city right that are divided into into sections of the city so for the sake of uh, simplicity here i'll just say for example one calculi could be the east side the west side the north side the south side etc etc and so those cal calpulis each one of those calpulis would um make up uh, a, a sort of an altepet which would be a city state okay and an autonomous uh city that had its own statehood right he doesn't say all that here but that is essentially how it's usually understood in the literature and we'll get to that here in a minute too so you go from the calpulis to number three you go to the region or the ikniutli of calpultin which are basically ikniutli the the stem word here is ikniut which is brother and so here we have brotherhood or fraternity in in english i think uh, fraternidad translates more into confraternities for those of you that have studied this or know about that uh it's similar to a brotherhood but a confraternity is a kind of takes on a religious connotation of sorts uh, usually within the catholic sense um so this was a group of friendship of hamlets right hamlets meaning um city states okay Ham hamlets is kind of an antiquated way of saying a, a sort of a city state uh, these places were autonomous regional entities and this was called a tlatocayot government okay 
And so I, if I'm not mistaken, the Tlatokayot form of government that he is uh, presenting here, it almost sounds like this is sort of the state, like what we would conceive of a state in modern terms, right? A Kalpuli is a city, uh, I mean, not a state, but um, a county. Uh, and so you go from having a city or a suburb or a town to having sort of a state, I mean, a, a county, Tlatokayot. It gets tri tricky because in some literature, Tlatokayot is referred to as a state. That's why I keep saying that. But in but in in Romero Vargas's uh, um, uh, way of framing this, Tlatokayot becomes instead of the state, it becomes uh, sort of like a county seat of sorts. And the reason why I say that is because immediately after this one, you have number four, the territories or lordships of the state. Right? He's he's saying this outright, autonomous but the authority dependent on the state, this was called a tecuyot, a lordship. So the tecuyot, according to Romero, Romero Vargas, is more akin to what we would call a state and not the tlatocayot. Okay, in the literature that I've, that I've looked at, and, and, and I looked at several pieces of, of literature for this, uh, for the purposes of this video, tlatocayot is usually meant as the state. Okay, but here he's he's giving us a little bit of a, a dis distinction between a county and a state, right? And so then we go to number five. The state independent called Wei Tlatokayot, the great government. And so I'm not sure if this is what he meant by that, but it seems to me that the, the Wei Tlatokayot, the state, is more of, of like a nation state okay because look if you go from having a calpuli which is a city or a town to having a tlatocayot which is sort of a county seat or a province and then you go from that to having a tecuyot which is more of a, a broader state of sorts which could also be uh, construed as a, as a larger province and then you have within the, the an assembly of tecuyots or tecuyotsin if that's if that's the correct way of saying it then you could have the state after that right you would have the way tlatocayot and the reason i say this is because when you come down to number six you see that he has the federation of states called tlatlaca ikniuyot brotherhood or friendship of rulers or Tecpilot, set of main states or palaces. And so this leads me to believe that this term here, and I think I'm butchering it because I'm, I mean, I'm not a native Nahuatl speaker, I'll try my best, uh, but I think Tlatlaka uh, Ikniuyot, I think what he's trying to say here with this term is that this is the word for confederacy, okay? Uh, so we go from Calpuli, city, town, to Tlatocayo, which would be sort of uh, county, to Tecuyo, which would be state, uh, to Wei Tlatocayo, which would be a nation, and then to this last one here, the Tlatoca Ignuyo, would be sort of the confederacy. And so this is the way that Romero Vargas Iturbide um, construes of the political organization of the people of Nahuac. Okay, and I made a little diagram here, uh, and I've only taken it to, to the nation level, the way Tlatocayot, uh, because an assembly or, um, or two or more of these way Tlatocayot uh, comprise uh, the, the Confederacy. And if you notice, there are three rings in this uh, star, I think it's called a starburst chart. Uh, you have the outer ring, which is basically the Calpuli. You have urban Calpuli, you have rural Calpulis, and all of these Calpulis uh, fall under the Tlatocayot. 
which is an ignutely, which is a brotherhood, right? A brotherhood. It's another way of saying the go the government seat of these different cities. Okay, and then all of this falls under the the cuyon. So you have city, county, state. One, two, three. And then all this, these three or more, right? there's only three shown here, but three or more of these comprise the way Tlatokayo, which would be the nation state. Okay. Um, and so, as you can read here, you know, following Romero Vargas' Iturbide's classification, this would be the equivalent of a nation state, the way Tlatokayo. Um, I'm not really sure how it compares to the Altepet, which I kind of briefly mentioned. Uh, Altepets are usually understood as an ethnic, political, and territorial entity. So uh, it could be that the Altepet is uh, a collection of Kalpulis into one entity, right? So there could be uh, um, a layer here, a circle here between Kalpuli and Tlatokayo that encompasses the Altepet, but I'm not sure. I think I need to do some more uh, work on that to figure that out. Um, the Spanish definition, you know, this is taken from the, week, the Spanish wiki for Altepet. Se entiende como una entidad tanto étnica como política y territorial en las que se organizaron los pueblos mesoamericanos en el periodo postclásico eh, dentro del, del año 1200 al 1521. So this is the political organization of the Altepet and the way it as uh, Iturbide, Romero Vargas, describes it would have been the kind of political organization that emerged in what scholars call the post-classic period uh, between the year 1200 and right up to the, uh, the eve of the Mexica Spanish War that led to the defeat and fall of Mexico Tenochtitlan and the Triple Alliance and then the domino effect that happened after that in central Mexico. Um, and so, as I was saying earlier, the standard classification uh, for the political organization of Mesoamerican societies, as far as ac academic literature is, is concerned, uh, is usually basically described in terms of the Calpuli being the sort of the, the very, the small community, the barrio, the neighborhood, uh, and then the Tlatocayo is sort of like uh, uh, the the city state, and then the way Tlatokayot is more of the nation state itself. Okay, this idea of the Confederacy doesn't really uh, uh, ring true in the way that Romero Vargas explains it. Uh, they, you know, there is literature that talks about alliances. For example, the Triple Alliance was a way of Tlatokayot. And the way Tlatokayo was comprised of these city states, Tlatokayots, right? Um, and so uh, I think that this idea that uh, there was this, this grandiose confederacy of nation states in, in, in Anahuac, is, I think, is overstated by the literature that is put out by Mexicanistas, uh, by people who are uh, followers of the Mexicayo tradition, people who have uh, read and studied Romero Vargas y Turbides' work, and uh, I think he overstates that in his book, and I think people have just sort of uh, jumped off from there and overstated themselves, you know, uh, those classifications. Uh, and in terms of these two words that are not found in this list, but are found in Romero Vargas' list, the Tlatlaka Ignuoyot and the Tecuyot, these do not even register as I'm as I wrote here in most academic sources, and almost every single mention online leads back to Romero Romero Vargas's own work, and that is problematic because that means that there's no outside source besides Romero Vargas that discusses these two political organizations that he talks about in his work. So since he didn't bother to cite any of his sources, we have no clue as to the provenance of these terms. And so here I'm not suggesting that he made them up, 
because it could be true that he found them in some old literature that existed from the colonial era. Um, but, you know, he didn't cite his sources, so we don't know that. We don't know where he got these ideas from. Uh, so it is likely that, you know, if they do exist, they could be referring to something different altogether. And we just don't know unless we dig very deep and try to find um, some of these words and, and see like the context in which they were written so that we can glean from those sources what we think was most the most likely translation of those terms. And it could be that, you know, Romero Vargas was onto something, but we just don't know. And so to take him at his word and to, uh, you know, unquestion uh, the things that he wrote and, and that he says, especially since he doesn't provide sources, that itself is problematic as well, okay? Um, and so that's basically this video. Um, thanks for watching. Um, comment down below. Let me know what you think. Subscribe to my feed. Uh, share this uh, with your friends on your social media networks. And uh, I guess we'll see you next time.